Yeah. 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 Morning, thank you all for attending. Uh, good to see you all. We are a couple of kids from Bar Back and Mountains in Australia. He says, zooming in, and uh, we will start today with looking at our agenda. Um, oh, I'm Harrison Pierce, Chairman of Health and Human Services. First item on the agenda today is the approval of the February 2nd, 23 minutes. Make money. Any comments, corrections? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great comment on Nick when we had our last meeting and the phone was going off in my pocket. We had a of crisis here. What Greg was talking about baby, et cetera. And then it was my voicemail telling me that she was thinking of that so overwhelming in the high school the vaping issue that she was thinking of setting up this club have people join it so they can in piecemeal fashion become involved and then wean themselves from it so that gives you a little idea of the scope of the club. And, and it is moving at this not going yet but yeah um reports health department jen austin Jenna, Austin, Director of Health. Um, basic data is that I sent you yesterday. There is one new data point that DPH um, extrapolated about the bivalent booster. So before it was just with booster, we didn't know if it was one, two, or three in some people. So that was an interesting data point that 30.20% of New Canaan has had a bivalent booster. Um, Testing and vaccinations, we've totally moved out of Irwin. Everything's been moved to Vine, and you know that's going uh, smoothly because you know volume's down, so it's not an issue using Vine Cottage for both. Aces are down. We only have six this week, which is nice. <laughs> Hopefully, that's you know a nice spring to come. Um, one point to, that um, Harrison just brought up about tobacco. I've been asked by the state health department. Um, health program associate to um, comment on the tobacco campaign for um, adults and for youth. And I'm one of 12 health directors in the state of Connecticut that we're going to provide feedback on all these items. And they're going to help tailor their grant with the CDC because originally it wasn't aimed at youth. And we all were like, youth is you know, the biggest issue. So she was vaping. So I'll keep you posted on that um, and share anything that comes of that. So hopefully this issue will be addressed more directly. Um, in general, uh, building permits were down um, in February. Everything else has been remained the same. The state had two major changes just come up. The state uh, septic code has changed. That's why I have to leave early today. I have to go to Gary Ann. For the state presentation on that. But they also kind of dropped the bombshell on uh, February 16th that the FDA code has now been adopted. So um, I sent a letter to all our restaurants and the code is drastically different in that there isn't a numerical grading system. So there's what they call priority foundation items, priority items, etc. And each one has a different time that you go back and inspect. So you're in these restaurants now a lot more, which is, you know, the last thing local health needed was more. So some of the items you're back within 72 hours, some of the items you have to go back in 10 days. And um, it's going to be a learning curve because the restaurants are used to, this is your score, you pass or fail. What we don't know is for re-inspection fees, because we charge for when you fail, we have to go back of how that's going to work, like which one of these is a failure, because we don't want to keep whacking them with fees because they change the code that you have to go back three times. We don't think that's fair to the restaurant. So when the state gets it resolved, we'll know because it kind of took everybody by surprise, even though it's been in, you know, discussion since 2017, the legislature has kind of suddenly hit it. So they don't have the inspection forms yet or anything. So that's interesting. Well, once we get all that, we'll be having training the restaurants on the new inspection forms. Gino and I did have to take 45 online courses each um, with the FDA, which is another fun thing that you know we don't have time for, but you know, it is what it is. 
45 courses. 45 <laughs> online courses. How uh, much time? Appreciate And you had to produce the certificate and send to the state of each one in order for them to verify you and recertify you as a food inspector. So no, it took that we um, knew was coming. So that took a couple months to be able to do all that work. Um, with the FEP grant update, uh, Bethy and I and uh, around 16, 17 others from Duquesne, we had, we had probably the biggest group. In um, Stratford, they had what they call the active shooter recovery planning. And it's not about the shooting itself at this mock parade. It was about what you all did after the fact to, you know, get the stuff coming in. Things you don't think about, like Newtown said, about like the teddy bears and stuff. Things like donations of like how to manage everything. So I thought that was great that New Canaan had such a huge representation from the PD to fire to spur to EMS to St. Luke's, the public schools, country school, Silver Hill. I mean, in voices even came. So it, we really had a great group. So I think that was great because unfortunately in this day and age, happening more and more, we hope it never happens here, but it does, you know, will be there. Um, budget wise, I presented the Board of Finance on the 9th. I go back to town council on the 16th and that's the final hurdle of the budget. So we'll see what happens there. And that's about it. Is there any major resistance of any of your ideas for the future with the budget? Oh, no. Actually, in fact, it's the opposite. The Board of Finance was phenomenal, you know, because I cut some items to try to get within the guidance we were giving of the two or three percent. And when I was discussing, like, the um, the QPR training that we are mandated to have to begin to do, you know, buying those books and everything, they're like, well, if you need the money, you know, just tell finance to put it back. And so again, my online permitting of 100,000 for capital is now going to be taken out of contingency. That will be approved next week. And then I go to BOS with the contract on the 21st. So by April 1st, we'll be beginning that process of getting everything online instead of July. So the Board of Finance is, was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, yes, Tom. You mentioned restaurants. I know that's a fairly active, continuing activity, continuing activity. Mm -hmm. How are our restaurants? Are safe eating at them? What do you find? Everything's online if you want to read their inspection report. But um, yes, our restaurants overall, they're very good. And if there is an issue, Either it's corrected on site or when we go back, it's done. It's very rare when we have to really bring you in for a hearing or threaten to close you. And a lot of the older places that have gone that have like old ratty equipment, they're gone and have been turned over. But no, all our inspection forms are actually online. So I'm glad you brought that up on the town website under agendas and minutes. So anybody can look up anything. It's all freedom of information. Thank you. You were influenced to price me alone. Yeah, I wish I don't even get this. There's a few There's a I would like a discount on my bar tab. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> That's too big of a discount. <laughs> a, a, a couple, a couple quick things that I saw. Um, anaplasmosis. Uh, you for the sake I know it was only one. Um, but when I did, you know, not knowing too much about it, I did some research, 25% uh, hospitalization rate mm -hmm. for that versus only 5% for Lyme disease. So, you know, is this because of the winter hasn't been yeah, this a year? Correct. The last two winters haven't been very cold. So the ticks now are dying. We're still having people, like I saw on the report, bringing ticks because they're not dying off. Mm -hmm. So it's 60 something degrees for dinner. I mean, I'm just surprised yeah. at the hospitalization rate. And the other is, is it possible without maybe just presenting the data, the two, if we could look at uh, suicidal ideation rates, which is like nine right now, and then the OD map was another six, so that's 15. And we compare that number to how many people that we're seeing uh, in Super Hill in terms of the kids. Uh, that there, is, is there a correlation between increasing number of visits and exposure to the Silver Hill program to reduce the ideations that we're seeing 
died in the hospitals. I just want to know if there's going to be a correlation over time. Was Susanna coming to that? I mean, I could easily, if I get the data from um, Bethany, I can go back through all of it and do a comparison for you guys. Yeah, we see if Silver Hill, they might be doing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll ask Susanna. Which yeah, so that would be yeah, great, great to great. see if there is a correlation and, and is this move of the needle, uh, which I would hope it's doing. Um, but that's those are still alarming numbers to me. Uh, nine suicidal ideations and then uh, the OD map having, and again, because uh, it's still towards the lower end of the scale, too. Which is that's so we're in the beginning when I first started pulling these, it was the polar opposite. So, I mean, I'm surprised by the male component, yeah, because no, because what they keep telling you is it's female, female. So, yeah, we'll do it for our ideation. It's got it's been more open. Yeah. The males are more successful when they attempt. When you look at those numbers with the opioid as well as the suicide ideation, even though they're not big numbers over 90 days, single digits, it's still um significant in the male female differential. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing in our communities looking for the males. I think that's a great point here too, because there's a lot of the, you know literature that you know you can about. Especially teenage girls. Mm -hmm. This is really striking stuff. I and mean, um, you know, I'd love to hear a little more, you know, from some expert area, like what are the kind of core drivers in this moment in time, which is really affecting young and you know, teenage, teenage boys and young men. Isn't is that something to do with the fact that um, successful suicide attempts tend to happen over the age of 60 and then, and this seems to be younger than it's a generational? Um, um, like, uh, yeah, there was some research. Hi. Research. <laughs> <laughs> Bar? Oh, it's Kim Norton. Hey, hey. Kim. Um, Yes, there was some research that I think was presented earlier that um, people over the age of 65 actually are successful when, when they, when they uh, you know, there's no ideation, they just go right to, to forming. That, that is, we found that to be true, and it's usually over overdosing of drugs, whether it's by accident or they do it on, on purpose. Um, I would just want, you know, I think it's yeah. a way to track, the, you know, our success and how many cases we have, which helps prove our point, which helps with funding, which all, all of those things yep. I think it's important to do. So we'll ask Susanna uh, Silver Hill to their um, metrics because they, they said they are. Yeah, so Andrew and I were sharing some data with Susanna as well, and I hope uh, it's great that he got better, got here to present, but there are some other factors that are going in in terms of sadness and bullying. The Wall Street Journal just came out with uh, some research uh, on that, which Suzanne and I and uh, Andrew shared and took a look at. So, uh, with, the, be nice. with the teenage, with the teenage, with the with the especially younger younger uh, uh, females, yeah, younger females and and social media and bullying, sadness and things of that nature, which are you know build up to this level. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to address it earlier on. But again, the, the young boys is what I'm struck by. Uh, and I think even for like the parents in the community, a lot of times they're not thinking about fragility. It's not a bad message to get out and say, hey, keep, keep your eyes out because it's, it's rotating a little bit towards you know, men, which was, I think, be very surprising to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, Follow up on Jen's presentation. So the anaplasmosis, they're usually more acutely ill, it's about a 25% yeah. Finland and they're with Lyme. And, um, you know, and they're essentially okay. They defend well on the graft, that's stage one. And then it goes with the joints, which most of the time you don't have to cost Um So our 30% of the black and cocaine naturally it's about 10%. And the numbers are that it improves your you know, protection or antibody level by about 10 to 30 percent. So it's not enormous like the initial vaccine is worked. Um, okay. Um, next, human services, Bethany. Hi, everybody. Bethany Zorro, Director of Human Services for New Canaan. 
Um, my report starts with uh, the presentations. We have one more budget presentation, Jen and I. We do the Health and Human Service app. Um, and so we have one more town council on March 16th. Everything is going well. I do you know, want to stress what Jen said too that the uh, council, the boards have been fantastic in terms of support. So we're very appreciative of that. Uh, the OSHA bloodborne pathogen training, we completed that yesterday. Um, I just have one more in the spring when I do the lifeguards for the that are hired for the pool. And thanks to Jen, um, I approached Jen in terms of being able to piggyback on the town's new payment software, which Jen has done incredible work on trying to figure out what the best what the best program is. And I asked her if we could possibly get a donation link on the human services website. So people don't have to pay by check to donate. One more RPA. And so it, yeah, Jen said it could be done. Yeah, we're working on that would be part of the development. Cause you know, a lot of people with the check washing going on are very nervous and yeah, you know, so, and so, so Bethany asked me during the budget, after the budget presentation, I thought it was a great idea. So we're going to have some type of donation, which is better, and uh, a letter of tax acknowledgement will still be sent out, but it just facilitates, and we hope that the donations will be easier to to give um, the public. And so we're going to start that, and I'll get some training on that. So thank you, Jen. Uh, working with West End Human Services, possibly coming on board with the uh, urgent assessment program. Things look very good. And that would be a great contributor monetarily. Um, do we see grant for that uh, money? Money that we would accept when we get the donations from residents if we make it available online. But we also go to uh, organizations that grant, like Rotary and the Foundation and others, for so, contributions. To yeah, fund we industry. really don't apply. For grants, um, but what happens is, back there. yeah, yeah. Uh, we, what we do is the agencies that we use they apply for the grants okay. to help New Canaan. Um, we're not in position as a municipality to apply for these grants. A lot of the criteria, but we do keep to the state grants mm -hmm. that we can apply yeah. to, um, but more so the agencies around apply like kids in crisis you know applies to new Canaan community right. foundation things like that we would be double dipping uh by doing that um next thing let me see it was with jennifer uh jen at the uh, tabletop exercise for the active shooter there's been so many aspects after an event like that as just like the, the bears from newtown i mean thousands and thousands of bears what do you do with them so things like that and this is where the town would be involved and the uh, decision makers what to do with these kind thoughts. At the same time, it becomes a burden, um, but you want to respect the, the kindness. So um, Silver Hill, uh, they have a great virtual grand round uh, series. And so I've been attending those. Uh, there was a great one with burnout and maintaining empathy with clients. Huge. It was very, very knowledgeable and uh, very helpful for our situation. Having uh, people come in, you know, it can, it can be a down day sometimes when you get uh, viewing things as a negativity on someone's life. So that that was a good pick me up. Uh, we've started the wellness fair organizing organizing for the employees at every two years. So we will have that in October. Hoping we can do flu vaccine at the same mm -hmm. time. Talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. Um, we're recreating a new Canaan Human Services Behavioral Health Resource Card. Greenwich has one, and they work with uh, Kids in Crisis on it. So I've been working with Kids in Crisis in Greenwich. We'll get that out uh, in a timely manner. The uh, cost of it probably will be done in July 1st for the next fiscal year. Um, it's expensive to get the cards done. We want to get them done right. So we're just in the uh, designing process. We are starting the farmer's market next uh, go around with the farmer's market voucher program that is given to food pantry clients. So they're able to attend 
uh, you know, it's somewhat more expensive, the, uh, the fresh fruits and vegetables and, and the grocery store. And so it's a win-win for the vendors as well as for the clients. So we'll start that, uh, working on that going on with uh, the uh, farmer's market master. The master. Yeah, the market master. The market master, let's see. So we're going to uh, continue our referrals. It's a little quieter in February, but we're, our referrals are continuing with this senior housing, protective services, uh, family advocacy, uh, out-of-state Medicaid issues. People are moving uh, into the state with their adult children, as well as out-of-state to their adult children. So we have a lot of Medicaid questions that Marcy and I uh, are helping people navigate. And we're continuing our grief counselor certification process, Marcy and I, we're almost there. And then the two, food pantry distribution, actually it's happening today, we usually have two in February. It was just one uh, normal attendance and then the other one was postponed to today because of uh, Tuesday's you know, storm and the schools were, were closed and we follow that, that calendar when the schools close. Uh, we see the blood pressure clinics are continuing uh, at, at Schoolhouse, Lapham Center, and we do have walk-ins. Telehealth participation. Uh, we're at 23 participants. There, the website is outdated. It's presenting issues for people receiving um, feedback through the telehealth dashboard, which I sent feedback through. Uh, many of the emails now, because of security, are being interrupted in the spam or else they're just going, they're not even being sent. So we're having a little communication loss. Uh, Jim Bell, who worked on the setting up of the program, is talking to the host of. Uh, yeah, I forgot his name, but yeah, uh, it's time Larry, to, look to look at telehealth in terms of upgrading because we are losing participants because of the access that they're not getting. Uh, because of the uh, email addresses they have and how it's configured in the dashboard. Uh, and then lastly, and we, I thought we were going to tell you we don't have any evictions, but we do have one coming up next week. Um, and let me see, I'll be speaking. CERT has asked human services to come and speak. I'll be speaking at their meeting this month in terms of human services. Uh, how to, in the event, they were at the uh, mass shooting recovery plan and realizing that human services, you know, there's a population that might need more help than others and they would like to start maybe being able to have access um, with working with us if there is a situation um, that they can help us with. I'll be speaking with them. And then I will be on vacation all next week. But, Everybody will be still at Human Services and so on to the Jackie, and they will hold down the fort, but I will definitely still have access. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, email me, um, call my, you know, leave a message, I will get back to you. Uh, the, oh, the ordinary people benefit that the Decatur Urgent Assessment uh, was the beneficiary. Uh, they raised, uh, writing a check to New Cane, uh, to the Silver Hill New Cane and Urban Assessment Program for $18,000. Saturday night was an unbelievable uh, turnout, and it was a very intimate night uh, of people getting together, not only for an excellent play, but as well as for the commonality that we are aware that, you know, we do have behavioral health issues in our town, and uh, we want to embrace it and see what we can do to continue the uh, urgent assessment program providing relief to the town. In a, in a uh, that way. is, is Western. So they're interested in the line. Very, very. They don't do with ARPA funding? Yes, so they do have some ARPA funds left over. And um, yeah, wanting to see where they, they love the plan. They feel it is definitely something that their town could benefit from. Um, having a town, their population is around 10,000, ours is 20, so maybe some negotiating going on in terms of um, the number of people that might utilize it is obviously half the population, so they're, they're working with Silver Hill, um, the human services director, 
Alice of Lisbon is incredibly involved and understands the importance of having something like this for her for her community. So uh, we're all working together and it, it, it's looking good. I don't want to, I just want to knock on wood. What about Darianne? Are they still in the game? They're still learning about the program. Um, as you can see, they are a percentage of the referral sources. Um, Darianne is coming and utilizing the program. So it's a matter of the town players seeing the importance of it. Um, I know they've hired people to run a behavioral health. And so maybe, you know, this is who Silver Hill is in touch with, Kevin's in touch with, first select woman. Everybody is getting in touch with everybody and trying to keep that education going with the program and the needs and hopefully. Yeah, Newtown is sending down a contingency in two weeks to take a look and have a chat. To say, yeah. yeah, there's a learning curve. I mean, to understand what, how it does make a community more um, cohesive in terms of getting help for their other, other towns. Other towns are doing. I, I brought the play bill in from from Saturday. It was a, a great event. If you want to take a take a look at the the program, um, it was very moving, and and I think everyone who was there was. Uh, was very supportive. So yeah. I hope that that funding, you know, that funding continues and donations continues. I also said that um, when I asked to look at this, um, I looked at Wilton as an example, and they use another program. So it's not like these towns are not using a service. So Wilton has another service that they use outside of Silver Hill who comes in and does does assessments. So uh, it's really looking at cost, you know, pressures. Um, and every every town is feeling a little bit of cost pressures on their on their budget right now, especially with the board of board of ed going up very high and, and a lot of the costs going up in the town. So, do you know what Wilton uses? Uh, I do. I'll, I'll get I'll get that information to you um, because early on that was we were poking in that direction to align. There's a program that I promised. Uh, I I don't even want to guess what it is, but I I, I will say it is. They spend less than ten thousand dollars on on, it's on their program. Um, yeah. but I talking to Silver Hill about it. Um, I think Wilton and Westport have com combined their forces, and it is a service. But it it we don't have the name of it. Um, yeah. Uh, I yeah, it's, and it, when it was explained to me, the level and the spectrum of mental health that it can help is very, it is smaller. I don't, I don't want to knock it because it's still a viable resource if you have very limited costs, I mean, very limited funds. Uh, Silver Hill can handle any type of medical mental health issue because of the professionalism. So it gives us a broader range of helping somebody and immediately and uh, having access. This one, it, you know, it, it is definitely a, a great resource. Um, so I don't want to knock it because it definitely provides a community with some type of behavioral health access. It makes the world so special, it's no question asked. Yeah. If you're really, you know, if there's a concern, our doors are open as opposed to qualifying it in a certain way. Yeah. Access is a huge problem. Um, it's the access, yeah. Um, Silver Hill has worked with this agency when um, people, there's not a lot of money in the family as well as the behavioral health need is not that great. I hate to finish it because any behavioral health need is great, but this is the agency can practice within the guidelines that Silver Hill thinks that this person needs. So they do use this agency, Silver Hill, for that specific type of need. So if you go to the specific type of need and you need more, 
Yeah, it, it is an inspection program. I mean, I don't I don't want to take away from that. I'll get more information because yeah. that stuff look at it. Yeah. Both yeah. well, been involved in wine Westport and Ranch have been quite at the avant-garde for the years in terms of health and mental. Yeah. Um, our meeting just goes a step ahead. Uh -huh. um, they are kind of leaders more proactive than some of these other areas. Uh, I'm trying to find the the uh, stream of emails in the back and forth asking me that same question. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll we'll find it. Find it's it. positive. Susanna probably said it. Yeah, yeah, she'll she'll know when she comes today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's coming yeah. at nine thirty. Okay. So this is this, I have. Uh, Kate and Pierce is coming, but there's uh, Judy. Has to develop the confidence. Yeah. So, as but we know, she told us on Monday, she bowed out. So, I asked Susanna Lewis, who runs the community uh, director of Silver Hill, as well as she runs the Behavioral Health Alliance yeah. for New Canaan. So, great. Before we get more, you know, we'll do more of the behavioral health, but um, I remember a few months ago. We were starting to see more activity around the kind of economic financial pressures and assistance. You know, yeah. momentum was gearing up, and I think the economy was not in great shape. I'm kind of noting that there doesn't appear to be a, a surge in that. How would you characterize the, the degree of um, safety net kind of thing? Right. So what these, now that people are signed up for energy assistance, yeah. those that needed it, yeah. so very few are coming in now. They've already signed up. So they're getting their energy assistance through the state, federal, and then when they come to us, they've already been assessed and they say, you know, I've gone through my energy assistance awards, but I need a, a drop off of oil. So then we do it. So this is already a continued client now. It's no longer a referral or a new client. This is just doing business. In they general, have different data points, are you seeing more economic and financial pressure is that is that building or is it kind of no people have found their outlet right now we're yeah. not seeing an influx of panic people like, it is it's stabilized yeah. it's stabilized help has been found uh, there is still the rent is still an issue that we're seeing people um, have just been putting off paying rent they're paying for other things. Yeah. And we are definitely helping with rent issues. But nothing, February is a quiet month. It's been a quiet month for us. So I'm not seeing any spikes right now. Yes. February is over. <laughs> yeah. What we'll see now in March is uh, people looking at the spring, which that starts the registration and signups for the summer. Camps. What are, what are we going to do with the kids while mom's working? So we'll get daycare camps, things like that. We'll start coming into play, and we'll help with that. Are you noticing um, so the SNAP um, increase ended and Medicaid depending for certain individuals? Yeah. Are you preparing, are you preparing for that? Or do you think it's not going to be an issue? It has not become an issue yet. Um, What's happened is now SNAP, um, they're thinking of other programs. Okay. So what happens is, yeah, when these programs stop, they start, another one will come in. Well, I think the emergency assistance program ends uh, May 11th. Yeah. And you had the people going on to Medicaid, just filling out an application, and it wasn't such an onerous process. Yeah. Um, so the studies I've seen as much as 20% of them will be not eligible for Medicaid yeah. anymore. And that's what that is going to be a for our seniors, especially yeah. uh, who are dual eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, that is going to be an issue. Right. And, and just younger disabled people as well. Exactly. 100%. Right. right. And so we'll see hopefully the uh, guidelines for Medicare savings programs, things like that. Hopefully they'll change yeah. and lower um, so that people, more people can be on that. Yeah, and we'll see. But right now, we're not seeing anything. Usually, we 
we we see it when there's a planet. That's usually after the deadline. Right. But people go, oh, this happened. And now they feel it. It's when they feel it that they come in. Yeah. Um, I was told that as soon as this month, they're going to start um, assessing people. So I think that's making people really nervous, especially like the like, transportation issues or yeah. communication. Yeah. So. Okay, next time on the agenda, old business, the ARP competition and grant. So Jim's been involved with this, and, uh, Jim Laddick, and Bob mm -hmm. Ackenbaum, and Greg Riley. But Jim, want to update it on where we are? Well, we are ready to start tomorrow with Greg with another draft again. My new BFF. <laughs> An old BFF actually from the tennis court, but, oh. but he's more than an itinerant tennis player that turns out. Now, actually, we've had a, a great, great communications grouping on this with the uh, development people at both agencies, Silverdale and Waveney. And uh, again, it's uh, we'll be coming out a very cumbersome grant for not a lot of money. It's going to be fifty thousand dollars per year in the Stephanie program for twenty people, and twenty five thousand for the way many people focused on low income seniors. As a, both these cases are bridge funds, because as you may recall, the ARPA money runs out on both programs in July, and so and the other thing that's interesting about AARP, you have to spend the money before the end of November. So, so anything you're writing against has to be for four or five months. And um, anyway, it's been interesting, and I, I'm totally convinced that this town is so far ahead of most people who are submitting these grants, which are looking for park benches and flower gardens and whatnot. That's the problem, is that we're asking for 50 in order to try to get strategically separated from a point uh, that are going to be looking for these 20,000 20, is a big grant for these, this uh, AARP segment. On the other hand, lots of national foundations always look, look into what the AARP is trying to solve for their livable community efforts. So it's, it's been a wonderful effort and totally that we'll get something. We have a uh, Greg who won a grant for the right. poor, so he so he knows how to ring his bells down in Washington on this thing and with high content of what we're serving up plus his experience of how to manage that process. I'm great company. We're going to submit as a final child. Uh, the urban assessment program will be done by the town and, and revenue would come to the town and apply to the program. The waiving program will be submitted by waiving. We're drafting it and we'll send it over to Christine to uh, hopefully load it in this early next week. You know, we follow the data with the standard assessment. So for now, we'll get more in update. Yeah, and we're yeah. only we with waving in terms uh, of we participation in telemedicine and all. Yeah, that. telemedicine, we have um, as of yesterday, we have 97 uh, people that are uh, connected to tele telemedicine. Um, we have of the 97, about 55 who are short term sick uh, residents, meaning that they come on board, they just had discharge come from the hospital. Uh, they're having acute care episodes, things of that nature, and they those are rotating off. So um, we don't we have a population that is coming on and is maintaining the telemedicine, and then have others who will come on for like a eight week period of time and then rotate rotate off and have another other group come so on. We got about forty people that are pretty involved. In yeah, permanent response. Um, and, that, is that, is that, yeah, we're, we're really pleased. Good. We just did a uh, presentation to the Board of Finance, I guess, uh, a month ago. What we're really pleased at is the number of ED visits that have been prevented, the number of hospitalizations that have been prevented. Um, telemedicine does link to your primary care doctors. So if your diuretic uh, 
isn't being taken, you start putting on weight, you have congestive heart failure, uh, our algorithm alarms, and we contact your physician, we change your meds through a nurse, um, but everything is done through your primary care physician. And so what we've been tracking is those kind of cases of, of being able to prevent an ED visit or, or a hospitalization. So those are the, the numbers that are important to us. And, and it, it is a one-year uh, ARPA grant, um, and we've uh, committed to continuing continuing the program. And so uh, we'll we'll still be in the telemedicine. Uh, we just think it's too too good of a service. And uh, with our we're we're caring for 465 home care patients per day, uh, it really helps monitor monitor that. Where does the finance come? Uh, Waveney Wave &E, Wave &E has mm -hmm. been funding it. Yeah, Waveney &E has been funding uh, that section of it because it, for uh, when you're in the Waveney &E network, you're in the Waveney &E network. I mean, that is part of our mission as a nonprofit. Um, uh, you'll hear of this first of um, our short term uh, acute rehab center, uh, which is about 30, 38 uh, beds. Um, each of those beds will have a telemedicine uh, hookup uh, to it. Uh, the devices all uh, arrived on Friday. They're being installed uh, now as we speak. So a uh, physician has privileges, will be able to access the data at any point in time. Um, they'll be able to Zoom their family members at any point in time. They'll be able to stream movies, uh, learn educational programs on how to deal with their chronic illness. Um, so it's a it's a great platform and and um, um, so those are the areas that we're moving into it is part of a continuation of, of telemedicine. One of your things in talking about this with Christine is that the FRP activity is focused with bridge funding through a public private partnership funding for the whole moment. There are two national foundations that are capable of really putting some serious things behind the telemedicine. You probably you may recall that I was part of a four-state operation that moves telehealth telemedicine to keep people out of the ER and the hospital. You could reduce those ER trips by 75 percent or more, depending on what the malady of the senior was. And, and at the end of the day, uh, CMS has their we're going to sponsor it, didn't because and actually they set up a 40 million well, the story. They gave us a 40 million dollar grant. We run 100 sites off and through the 14 were up, but they made it so damn complex before we go over even Mount Sinai couldn't execute it. So you had to do them like that. But it, you can really have impact with what you're talking about, and particularly when you make it telemedicine instead of telemedicine. Well, the average re readmission rate in post acute care is 22%. Uh, so um, we're now on the home care side, we're down to 8%. Yeah. And our ED visa rates is uh, around 2%. So it, it has, you know, this was the ARPA funds were used as seed money, but um, we're going to continue the program afterwards. If you made it to the Great, thank you. Um, Susanna Lewis, thank you so much for coming this morning. And short notice, too, so we appreciate it. Well, that is the director of community relations at Silver Hill Hospital. Let's just run around the table on our superior chairman of health and human services. Peter Campbell, uh, Commissioner Bird. Elizabeth Kennedy, Commissioner. Susan, unfortunately, knows me well. <laughs> Not as a patient. Tom Ferguson, Commissioner. Uh, Russell, Park Park Commissioner, as you know, my roommate. Um, it's, it's nice to be here. I didn't know how many familiar faces at the beach. Um, and um, obviously, I'm not sure kind of what the conversations have been to date about um, the urgent assessment program in this group. So I'll kind of go through some of the February information that I sent. Um, but then really, um, whatever questions you have, sort of if there are direction that's helpful to go in this room, um, I'm, I'm open and flexible. So, um, I'm recorded. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
So February was um, one of our, and, and I can all give a range because not all of you have seen all the numbers to date. February was one of our quieter months. Um, again, after January had been, we had seen, um, I think we ended up seeing a total of 16 cases, which was the highest number we've seen um, so far. And then as, as we sort of live into the program and, and to see how the ebbs and flows go, it looks like five to six tends to be sort of our slower months. Um, so February was slower. Um, you know, we are still between children and adolescents. Um, that's that's still about 57% of the cases that we're seeing. And so um, there may be, you know, some of that movement has tended to flow with kind of school calendars and that kind of thing. So that may be a piece of it. Um, and then we've seen a total of 67 cases since uh, the July 7th launch. Um, again, you know, going to the age ranges, um, we're seeing, you know, four or last month was right around 50-51%. This month is 53% for children and adolescents. And when you, when you add in the young adult piece to that, um, what that the way it brings out is that we're really only seeing 29% of our cases over the age of 26. So that's that's something that we're kind of looking at, and um, uh, there's there's obviously work to do there. Um, I think some of that is, uh, you know, kids have eyes on them, and people who are taking care of their care, and so if something's wrong. They get referred and they don't always have a choice about going. Um, whereas you know, adults can self-refer or not. Um, and and so sort of, you know, then and I think there is also the dynamic with um with younger younger populations that I think mental health is a much more normal topic to be talking about and addressing and that kind of thing. And I think sort of just sort of generationally, it's different when when you're dealing with um, you know adults and then older adults, um, many of whom still are not. I'm going to say that part of what we're asking for in the AARP UA grant is money for marketing to seniors. Yes. If it's three percent, we know that seniors have a problem uh yeah. equal to youth in terms of depression during the pandemic and so we want to that that your observation from the silver hills perspective mm -hmm. your patient base there how does that so we, how does that compare this, so uh, it's not necessarily a fair comparison it's right um it's so there. we have of of our of approximately 100 beds only 20 of those are adolescent beds in any case so, and we don't, we see kids in this program, but we don't admit them to the hospital. So we don't have anything under 13 at the hospital. Um, but I would say then when you look at kind of the age range of, um, of the adults that we have, it's a pretty healthy distribution. It's not skewed in this way. Um, and, and some of that again too is that we're dealing with sort of higher acuities when you're admitting to the hospital. So again, those people might are likely to be less in this sort of gray zone of well, maybe I can go get help, maybe I can't, maybe I don't need to. Um, so it is um it this is not sort of represented. But you you from your expert perspective on the mm -hmm. expert at Silver Hill, they feel that there's there are a lot of older people that are not connecting to urgent with less assessment. Should be, could be. Yeah, adults. Yes. Yeah, for sure. That's an education job. Um, well, they, they, I just want to know: Do we have an unmet need? Do we know that? That's what we know that. Yes. I mean, because when we look at sort of, and I, I pretty pull all of this whole particular numbers and that kind of thing, but when you look at sort of the population wide data, um, this is not. I mean, you know. We know, yes, adolescents and kids, there's a huge crisis, but the numbers are also much higher for both adults and then for seniors. Um, so, so that is, um, that's obviously, that's, that's where there's room for. Professor Greg has a question. If I may, 
Susanna, the, the adult, we're talking about adults pursuant to Tom's question, and it's uh, it's a big age range, 27 to 60. Yeah. So could you hear Tom's question a little more about 50 plus? Sure. Um, and that's, I mean, that that's probably, um, you know, once you move past the kids and adolescents, then you have this kind of middle middle age range, and then you you know senior citizens. There's there's right. another sort of segment of the population where you do have um, a lot of data, and we we know there is unmet need there, um, and that um, the combination of um, I mean, you know, Jim has I guess it has probably talked about this here, but um, the combination of um, aging. Um, loneliness, uh, health problems that are sort of other health problems that may be coping up, um, and the way that sort of affects mental health too, that, um, that there are particular needs for that population. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about what, what Jim has sort of percolating. Um, and that would that would be a great opportunity for us to really dig down. Um, but then, um, for instance, Dr. Berger is going to go and present to at Lapham in April. We just recorded a video um, uh, with with Dr. Berger, Dr. Pinquay, and Jules Jones, who are our clinical team in the program, um, and myself. To it, and it's it's an informational video about the program, and the idea is that it can go right into people's homes, so people who aren't um, even necessarily willing to sort of like come to a big meeting in a room, um, you know, there will be an opportunity for them to hear and learn about the program, um, and we certainly hope that some of those people will be kind of. The population. I want to show Tom this graph that Dr. Gerber used to get the money from ARPA. You, you don't need to know what, what it says below, but just look at this number. This was not this was 2021 impact of COVID. The seniors was originally 11%, went in 2021, it was 41. Dr. Gerber's Expectation is it may be 60 to 80 percent at this stage of the game of seniors with stress and anxiety disorders. So it's a big problem. You have a, a lot of things going on. So when COVID did in 2020, you had mm -hmm. isolation, you had increased substance abuse, um, you had um, um, Concern about social security, concern about your what the market was doing. Um, you know, when you there are a lot of stressors on people over the age of 65, to the point where we're seeing in the marketplace people over the age of 70 are now coming back to the marketplace and applying for jobs because where their their savings are and their retirement funds are. So that you add all of those stressors. Uh, together, and um, we've been we've talked to uh, Silver Hill and Andrew way before ARPA and all of that about looking at geriatric psych as a, as an issue. Kind of we'll, we'll overdo this, but it uh, seems to me old, old people are, are financially have a lot of financial anxiety, and entering into program at uh, Silver Hill we cost a lot of money. I think that's a big barrier to do with education is the insurance and the financial risk. And maybe everything's covered, but probably not. I think it becomes point to be great to know in your sense of the different age ranges and populations in terms of where higher acuity issues are, because that's fundamentally what Slow Hill is about. Yeah. And then look at you know these numbers, and then we can kind of figure out well, what are the blockers. The different populations to, to the robust 45 year olds who just walk around town like everything's great, but it's not. You know, that's a certain kind of communication. And for the senior, it's a different thing. And I, I think the skew here, the, the way you're talking about the why is very interesting. And I think as, as the program becomes more refined, all of your partners, and we're one of your partners, can help on. 
the communication to make to start to level out so that these numbers represent are proportional to where the problems are. Yeah. Um, so I think, and this is this is it's interesting to hear you speak because um, I think, and this is maybe an education point that um, the, the program is housed at Silver Hill at Silver Inclusions. But coming to this program does not mean you're entering into a Silver Hill program for anything beyond oh, that. Right. And, and so Silver Hill does not expect treatment costs a lot of money. <laughs> you know? But what we really do in this program is we, each individual, we say, okay, what do you need to do for cost wise, insurance wise, with your ongoing care? And then we, and, and this is where a lot of the Hollywood program is. We do a very we find somebody who meets those criteria, and we follow them until they are connected with that person. So, um, but that very well could be somebody thinks, oh, I'm going to have an assessment. It's a, I mean, just there's there's an automatic association with a lot of expense, yeah, it, yeah. um, which. Again, not necessarily the case with this, but that's probably an important education point. And also the scary seriousness of silver, yeah. right? <clears throat> and this is you're, you know we're doing the assessment, but that doesn't mean you're you're <laughs> you're going to the yeah. yeah. And, and the, the hope. We we want to help avoid people meeting each other. We you know we the, the idea of this program is that it gets spaces before they are that far down the road. Um, and, and so again, that is perhaps the point that you I think it to. goes to a coping mechanism, right? Seniors, based upon their lives, life cycles, have found ways to cope exactly. with stress, right? Um, whereas we're trying for the next generation of children to find a healthier way to cope with stressors and to be able to reach out and, and um, our gen senior population that we deal with, it is, you know, I don't have a problem. I've dealt with my problem all my life and all the stressors. And so they have that, that barrier that they put up there themselves. Certainly the cost they worry about right? And what is this going to cost me over time if I get into this, um, what they think is a vortex, right? That I'm not going to be able to, once I seek help and people realize that I do have issues, uh, this is going to drain a lot of a lot of my funds. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we talked about when we talked about geriatric psych and how to break down some of those barriers. Um, but uh, it, that's an interesting so which is breaking down like a, the demographics of each of them have different stigma access right. issues right because again we saw earlier the suicidal ideation of young boys is really disproportionate to young gals mm -hmm. and i know i've got two daughters and i know they're they talk about that stuff mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. but that's like just one mini population that they're like there's a problem mm -hmm. and then you know the, the like you stressed Middle age worker and folks where economics are starting to turn the wrong way. That's another kind of population. The senior thing, I can imagine as the program gets more refined mm -hmm. with all the great new data we have, there's ways to really optimize yeah, this and have different techniques for the different communities. Like the senior messaging would be very different than. Like, yeah, one of the things for people in my age cohort, basically, mental health was only for the crazy. I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, the home of Menners, yeah. Winter Guard, the Winter Veterans, which was the biggest yeah. veterans mental health op. And so every other person, psychiatrist in town. The fact is that again, why do they help this? Look at me. Yeah. Poster child. Yeah. But um, I, I think there's a stigma attached to. The words mental health means that I'm crazy or that I'm not ready for a shrink or whatnot. I mean, we, that's why the education is critical, I think, for older people. So and that's where, we're getting there. that's where, you know, it, when we started in July, sort of, we didn't know how this was going to unfold. And so as we, that's an exciting piece now, as, as we have some of the information, we can say, aha, uh -huh, we need to go here, we need to go here. Um, 
I think, you know, we are very open to, um, we want to collaborate with this group and any ideas that you all have about continuing to sort of make inroads. Um, we want to do that. And I think Dr. Gerber is, I mean, he's, he's like, he's a huge asset in a lot of ways, but he is so relatable and so just speaks so well. And I think getting in with groups of people is really effective because that immediately takes the kind of silver hill off of it um, a little bit, um, or at least sort of give somebody pause, like, oh, wait, maybe it's not all um, the scary and the, the, um, the, the foreign and all of that. Um, so yeah, we, we are- You gotta remember the senior population who remembers, still remembers the state hospitals yeah. and the state institutions, yeah. right? That's when we, so when they say you're going, that's that's the perception that Different. it's them of uh, those films in 60 minutes of what a state run uh, behavioral health uh, system used to look like. One of the things we talked about, and I don't wanna take up too much of your time, but um, we've been, we have been tracking as, as a, uh, commission uh, suicidal ideations that actually end up in the hospital and also uh, overdoses. And if you combine those two numbers, it's about 15 right now within a 90, uh, 90 day period of time. We'd like to be able to track to see if we can try to impact that that number. 15 among senior citizens or 15 in the general public? 15 of New Canaan. Okay. Okay. All ages. All ages. Fifteen and ninety-eight. Yeah. Got overdosed or had suicidal ideations, ended up in the hospital. I mean, that, those are the numbers to me that are. And Rachel, did you want to compare that to the program? Well, I'd like to see, you know, as as we're going for research dollars, which is a whole other segment. Yeah. If you can make a correlation between here's a, a town with this demographics, twenty-two thousand people. We implemented this program. We had over ninety day period uh, suicidal ideations and overdoses of this number. We implemented the program, and here's the needle has shrunk. And as we have a less acute approach, um, as, as compared to their them ending up in the hospital uh, in the emergency department, and that's what hits our stats. Over right? what period of time is that fifteen? Um, we ninety days. days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is it? And we have it by age. We have it. We have all. Of it. And is it? Is it suicide ideation or is it counts? Suicidal ideation. Just ideation. Yeah. I think it's ideation and attacks. If it's overdose, oh, um, the overdose, the OD map yeah. has the uh, actual attempts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so if if it's ideation, there's a whole other yeah. sort of group on top of that. Agreed. Right? Agreed. This is going to be an underrepresentation. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one question, if I may, one the, uh, related to the age ranges. So, you know, there are many needs at all levels. But when you look at the adults versus the seniors, do you see that as unmet needs equally or disproportionately? Or would you, should we be focusing more on the 70 to 80 year olds, or the 40 to 50 year olds, or is it just six to one half comes in there? I think, well, I mean, it, I think maybe it's too pronged because we're we're growing and we're sort of taking 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 the elephant bite by bite. Um, I think we need to um, you know we know that that seniors that's another area of particular need. Um, so I think you know the the um, children and adolescent piece has kind of evolved pretty naturally because we have the schools, we have doctors and parents referring all of that. Um, I think the next area to go to. Um, in terms of our emphasis would be the senior population and then kind of crack that nut a little bit and then sort of start to say, okay, what do we need to do in this middle area? Because I think it, it is, it's, it, um, as we're talking, it's, it's, here, it's gonna be different for every group. And I think um, just sort of uh, tackle it piece by piece. I mean, that, uh, that is important. To me, anyway, I can't speak for the whole commission uh, because we try to move the 
the needle gives us a base point of doing it. Um, so I would just say for this is this is real numbers for people who are discharged to us out of the hospital, about 25% of them come um, already under a, a antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication, 25%. Okay, so whether or not that they go into the hospital and they're already on the medication or whether or not the hospital is putting them on the medication, I only know that we track um, that coming to us. Uh, and to me, that was an alarming, alarming number. I will, I will say with my lived experience and disability and chronic illness, it's almost impossible to go through those experiences and not ask yourself for one or um, to have them prescribed for you because it can help in some cases with pain and, and things like that. Um, and honestly, the I scary of that 15 numbers for overdoses and suicide ideation in like my population that I'm used to that is like, I'm not surprised at all. Really? Um, yeah, I would say the majority of people, especially if you're still isolated in, in any way because of your health, you're not having a good time. What's interesting is that part of Russ's telemedicine software has a telepsych increment that we're going to start learning about because, again, we know from the commission's uh, TV series on connected mind and body that they are connected. Well, it, it certainly helps with isolation, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, one, one thing, it seems this is a great moment to really consolidate all of the learnings. And pretty much everybody here, we're all talking about real learnings, lived experience, and then start to think about kind of, especially because we need the funding sources, the evolution of the program optimization kind of a 2.0 because and, and not that that's got to be like oh my god we're going to transform everything but just uh what have we learned and how can we optimize and improve this is a great moment to do that because i can tell you from a funder's perspective that's always great that you see okay we've learned a lot of successes but we've also learned here's some improvements you're going to make and we expect better Results because I know there are a lot of people thinking about this, but to make it a little bit more informal, I mean, I'm talking about like a 2.0 at some, yeah, something like that. But that all opens up other funding sources to you as well, right? And so, this is what we learned from the adolescents, this is what we learned from, from um, like the workforce, this is what we learned from people over the age of 75. Now, it opens up different uh, funding opportunities for, for people that are interested in those, those age cohorts, for sure. Suzanne, the second question. Um, so we look at February six cases, that's unimpressive. And January 16, which is appropriate, yes. Well, when you look at those numbers um, and looking forward, can this program sustain itself in terms of being busy enough to, to give it a rationale to exist? Um, because you've got to have the psychiatrists and the PAs and Social workers, et cetera, that are busy enough with this one program to talk to be self sustaining from all sorts of perspectives, mm -hmm. not only financial, but their involvement, their time, et cetera, and be, their availability. Mm -hmm. But when you look at that, you can have the question so, yeah, pull in West End, maybe Newtown, or whatever the future you knows. Um, you know, they'll provide more patients, but I'm not blown away by the numbers that they go at this, this point in time. So, I think one one. So we like the program. We want to. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like, yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, one one piece of this is that as the program got going, we were intentionally very quiet about it. We didn't do outreach. I mean, it was sort of. No, I know. Relatively you awful. were afraid of being overwhelmed. And because we didn't yeah. know what the, and I think that um, we know that there is need out there. And we know now that we have to go and help bring it in. Um, and so so that's where um, I think I think yes, the short answer. I think the program is sustainable. It's important that it stays in place. Um, but we're getting a much better sense of what we're gonna need to do um, proactively to to sort of have it be utilized in a way that it that it should be mm -hmm. and needs to be. I know you had the meeting a couple of weeks ago at Silver Hill, and I was mostly marketing 
Yeah. 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 So, um, Dr. Gerber right now is in the process of reaching out to all of the primary care doctors to on one one to one basis in town, which. Um, what if we decided it was going to be much more effective than trying to pull people into a room for an event or something like that, but just so that we can have a conversation with them. And those thoughts are going to be important group because they're they are sort of the eyes and ears on people in their everyday lives um, when they're just kind of checking in with a dog. Um, so I think that's that's a huge piece. Um, the the um, one of the piece that also came out of it was um, his going to present at Latham and um, and having this video that we just recorded two weeks ago. Um, having one sort of target for that be um, sort of people's getting into people's homes, um, and so I think um, various distribution lists that exist, exist in town and that kind of thing. Yeah. He's also, I want to interrupt, he's also speaking tomorrow. Yes. At Wilton, there's a panel. So he's getting out yeah. individually to doctors as well as community-wise. And I just, yeah, and it's great. I think, but I think specifically out of that meeting, the, the really targeted primary care meetings, that's a big thing. Um, and, and what had happened how are those going? Is he, has he reported on how the receptivity among the primary doctors on this project? So we're we, just picking it up now. Yeah, we're, 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 we're just getting up. So we're so, happy that happy to report you. Right. Yeah, we have. <laughs> but I, I guess the final question to build upon is uh, um, when is the funding end? Or it's it was for a year, right? Uh, the year's almost up, is it not? I mean, the funds were uh, released in June. July. July. So, so July, we are... We're going into the ninth month. We're going into the ninth month. Yes. So, um, okay. Do you expect to see an increase March and April or so awful for people with depression? Do you expect to see any increase in those months? I would, I would expect to see an increase based on sort of um, our efforts yeah. and sort of people, efforts people that knowing yeah. about the program. And I, mean, I think it's um, uh, it's not sort of in, in the cycle that we see. I mean, we have the same cyclicality at the hospital right. times of year that get very busy. And March, April tends to be sort of normal, not, not particularly yeah. sort of high, but not sort of we see things get really quiet over the summer right <laughs> um you see things get really busy in september and october right. um, years, yeah. and in january as we did i mean the, the harrison's point though we're talking about a quarter of a million dollars and the denominator is why over a nine month period of time i think we need to you know think think that through a little bit of how to keep that funding going with the, you know, what, what would be the denominator at this point? Um, 36, what, how many total? What's the nine month total for the number of people? 67 in nine months. Yeah, I really There's an economic piece of it, but to me, this is a program that is going to build over time. <laughs> By definition, Harrison's point is really critical. There is a viability Absolutely. number that we're not at. But to me, that's okay because you started out quiet and we're going to have a marketing is a strange it's, word to use, yeah. but an awareness set of programs and it will it will get there. And I think most people will buy that, that the past will not be. Prologue, but this is why the 2.0 thing is important is that here's what we learned here the adjustments because Harrison's point is this is the dangerous piece. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I feel very confident with the intentionality. Yeah, and, that, and that's the piece that we all kind of sit here in. Um, <laughs> you know, not well, the kind of station is the return. How do you measure return on investment in mental health versus medical health, which is Bills and cutting and whatnot. The problem with mental health is it doesn't fall into these neat little boxes. And, and my conversations with Gerber and a number of people, it, it's very difficult to know how long it takes to get impact. Yeah. 
whether it, how long it takes to get impact to get you in to the assessment period, how long it takes to then generate recruitment and whatnot. And uh, it's it's it frankly requires somebody with some vision in the town to be able to say we should continue this. I think a huge community effort. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Can you get me um, follow up data on the 67 people, how they have fared since they've come through the program? So we have, so what we have to wait is, um, is more anecdotal. Um, and and that's, that's again, sort of, that's a piece that we, is sort of, okay, let's put this in place, kind of all of the outcomes measures, which are really important. Um, what we have had anecdotally um, are, are people who, Feel like they've really been helped um and and that goes all the way from sort of more acute cases where there was just a real there was an intense clinical need there all the way to the cases where it was a parent kind of not knowing what was going on with their kid and not knowing where to go and and just having that sort of navigation piece just changed things smoothly for them so so the feedback has been, um, I think, across the scale, clinically, um, really, really positive. Um, and but 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 it is again sort of to um, to the points that we're all making. Uh, it's time to start to quantify that. Yeah, it's good to hear. And also, um, it's great that Dr. Gerber is getting that not only with the PCP on our one of our is to the director. And yourself to get out there to the community because having been around for a while, Silver Hill has not always been held in the greatest way. Yeah. With Dr. Gerber there, there's the world really changed now compared to his predecessor or how you meant right. that, but she's nonetheless. It's a, so it's kind of middle of the past. So if you think it's start looking at that in a more positive sense, and maybe now I'm starting to, you know, get 10 years away from her, um, it's going to be very good. Yeah. And you, and you as well, your role, the fact that there is your role is, yeah. is really important. Yeah. 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 This, this, this can't be his main focus. He's running the conservation for that kind of way. Absolutely. So no. They need some other troops. Oh, everybody wants to talk to her. <laughs> yeah. um, we have people who can have heard you mention Dr. Grove. He's, 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 so um, he, he's been, yes, he's, he's been on the permanent for chamber. <laughs> The town player into the last few months. Um, but now he is, um, he's, I mean, we have so many wonderful clinical researchers and people, and, and, and that's where sort of like my job is the great one because I get to help deploy those into the community. I think that the last point that I would say on this is, you know, when you do the math, it comes up to about $27, $2,800 per, per person. I think you get other towns involved in everything. I think that the economics. That's the key is other communities joining in on this and having this multi faceted community awareness. Yeah, we just got to drive down the so it's all numbers for person. Yeah. yeah. And, and there, there are plans and conversations yep. in place for those to be happening. So and then I think we're getting near the end. Thank you again so much for coming. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thank you all for attending. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I know it's not for the two friends. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.